veiled in secrecy and often deemed heretical by Orthodox Christianity, the Gnostic Gospels are ancient texts that diverge from the canonical scriptures of the mainstream Bible. What sets these texts apart is not just the alternative narrative they provide, but the hidden teachings they contain. Teachings that delve into the concept of Gnosis, a form of intuitive spiritual knowledge. But why did early Orthodox Christian authorities consider these texts so threatening that they felt compelled to suppress them? What hidden teachings lie within the pages of these ancient scrolls that could shake the very foundations of traditional religious thought? And could understanding the secrets within the Gnostic Gospels be the key to unraveling some of humanity's greatest mysteries? We'll find out in the new episode of Secret Origins. Welcome. The Gnostic Gospels are a collection of ancient Christian texts that were accidentally discovered in 1945 near Nag Hammadi, Egypt. They were 13 leather-bound vellum codices written in Coptic and buried in a sealed jar found by a local farmer named Mohammed al-Saman. These texts are not part of the canonical New Testament and give most of the information that we now have about early Christianity and Gnosticism. But what is Gnosticism in the first place? Gnosticism is the name given to loosely organized philosophical and religious movements that flourished between the 1st and 3rd century CE. The term Gnostic comes from the Greek word Gnosis, which means knowledge or insight. Here it's not about just any knowledge, but it is a kind of knowledge of transcendence attained through intuitive and interior means. Gnosticism was not a unified movement, but rather a label applied to various sects that shared certain ideas. Generally speaking, Gnostics believed in seeking personal, mystical knowledge that would lead to salvation. They often had a dualistic view of the world, distinguishing between the spiritual realm, which was considered good, and the material world, which was seen as evil or corrupt. Ever since the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library in Egypt in 1945 and the subsequent publication of various non-canonical gospels and other lost ancient texts, there has been an increased interest in the early history and development of Christianity. The discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library and other Gnostic texts in the modern era has sparked renewed interest and reassessment of Gnosticism's role in early Christian history. The Gnostic Gospels are quite intriguing, as they provide alternative accounts and interpretations of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, as well as other biblical figures. Some of the more famous Gnostic texts include the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Philip, and the Gospel of Judas. Very briefly, the Gospel of Thomas is a collection of 114 sayings attributed to Jesus. It doesn't follow a narrative structure like the canonical Gospels, but presents these sayings in a somewhat random order. Some sayings are familiar and parallel those in the New Testament, while others are quite esoteric and mystic. Something is at work to, to not allow us to be blinded and, and silenced. Something, something is at work to allow these ancient ideas to come, to come back into the world. And Gnosticism has indeed. The Gospel of Mary focuses on Mary Magdalene and depicts her as a disciple closer to Jesus than the other apostles. It contains conversations between Mary and the other disciples and emphasizes the concept of inner spiritual knowledge. The Gospel of Philip is less a gospel in the narrative sense and more a collection of theological reflections, hymns, and liturgical texts. It touches on sacraments, the nature of the divine, and the role of male and female in the spiritual realm. The Gospel of Judas turns the traditional story of Judas Iscariot on its head, portraying him as acting in accordance with divine instructions. This text suggests that Judas' betrayal was a necessary part of the larger divine plan. Gnostic literature often reads like a catalogue of cosmic enigmas, framed in a language both allegorical and symbolically rich. These texts remove the veil of the mundane reality, offering a glimpse into higher spiritual dimensions and existential questions. At the top of Gnostic thought sits an ineffable, unknowable deity, often termed the Monad or the One. This divine entity transcends all human comprehension and is fundamentally different from the Demiurge, 
In many Gnostic systems, the unknowable god emanates lesser divine beings, including archons and eons. These entities participate in the cosmic drama, but are also mysterious, without clearly stating how these emanations relate to the ultimate god and what roles they play in the spiritual hierarchy. Another perpetual enigma in Gnostic thought is the origin and nature of evil. Questions such as whether evil is an inherent part of the material world created by the Demiurge, or is it a byproduct of ignorance and the lack of Gnosis, remain a main point of theological debate within Gnostic studies. Closely linked to the concept of evil is also the question of suffering. If the material world is a prison of sorts, then suffering would seem inevitable. Yet some Gnostic texts suggest that suffering can serve as a catalyst for spiritual awakening. So, could our struggles then be a path to greater enlightenment? Some Gnostic traditions, including the Gnostic Gospels, incorporate the idea of cosmic cycles, similar to Eastern concepts of karma and reincarnation. The soul's journey is thus not a linear progression, but a cyclical process full of mysteries that challenge our understanding of time and destiny. Or, as it is said in the Gospel of Mary, all natures, all formed things, all creatures exist in and with one another, and they will be resolved again into their own roots, for the nature of matter is dissolved into the roots of its nature alone. The Gospel of Mary Gnostic narratives frequently employ a cast of archetypal figures that symbolize deeper spiritual realities. For instance, Sophia, wisdom, often represents an emanation of the true, unknowable God and plays a crucial role in the cosmic drama that leads to the creation and eventual redemption of the material world. Jesus, on the other hand, often serves as a revealer of hidden wisdom, he is not just a savior in the conventional sense, but a guide who can lead earnest seekers towards Gnosis. His teachings, as represented in texts like the Gospel of Thomas, often diverge significantly from Orthodox Christian doctrine, offering alternative paths to divine knowledge. But why all the secrecy around the Gnostic Gospels? Why have they stayed hidden for almost two millennia? And what was the historical background during which these Gospels were written? The origins of Gnosticism are as complex and enigmatic as the teachings themselves, drawing from a diverse range of influences, including Hellenistic philosophy, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, and early Christianity. While the exact roots remain elusive, some scholars suggest Platonic philosophy. Others see it as an offshoot of early Christianity, or even an independent religious movement. The discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library in Egypt in 1945 significantly illuminated the diversity of thought among various Gnostic sects. The early Christian church viewed Gnostic teachings as heretical, leading to their suppression and exclusion from the canonical New Testament. Many Gnostic texts were destroyed and their teachings were pushed to the fringes of Christian thought. The church fathers like Arrhenius and Tertullian wrote extensively against the Gnostics, classifying their beliefs as dangerous deviations. So, the only way to preserve the Gnosis, the knowledge that the Gnostics had, was to hide the scrolls in a place where no one would find them. Now you can see a video game that's uh, photorealistic, almost photorealistic, and millions of people playing simultaneously, and you see where things are going with virtual reality. If you extrapolate that out into the future with any rate of progress at all, then eventually those games will be indistinguishable from reality. They'll be so realistic, you will not be able to tell the difference between that game and the reality as we know it. Well, how do we know that that didn't happen in the past and that we're not in one of those games ourselves? So, what was it about these Gnostic texts that made them so threatening to early Christian authorities? Central to most Gnostic worldviews is a form of dualism that distinguishes between the material and spiritual realms. Unlike Platonic dualism, which views the material as an imperfect reflection of the ideal, Gnostic dualism often portrays the physical world as a corrupt, almost prison-like environment. This perspective stems from the belief that the material world is the creation of a lesser deity, the Demiurge. 
In Gnostic belief in cosmology, there is an ultimate god who is beyond all known universes and who never took part in their creation. This ultimate god is often described as a true god who existed before everything and is the source of all light. This notion implies that everything in existence is essentially made of God's substance, blurring the lines between the divine and the created world. The Gnostic God is also conceptualized as a cosmic mind, which encompasses the universe and gains self-awareness through the consciousness of all beings within it. In addition to the true God, Gnostics believe in the existence of eons, which are intermediate divine beings. These eons, along with the true God, make up what is known as the Pleroma. The Pleroma is the spiritual universe that includes the totality of divine powers and emanations. Sophia is one of the eons, or divine emanations, who reside in the Pleroma, the realm of fullness where the true God of light exists. Sophia is typically associated with wisdom, but in a tragic turn of events, she deviates from the Pleroma and produces a flawed emanation, leading to the creation of the material world. This flawed emanation becomes the Demiurge, often depicted as a lesser god, responsible for creating the physical universe. Unlike the true god, the Demiurge is imperfect and lacks full awareness of the broader cosmological landscape including his own origins and the existence of a higher deity. Because of his ignorance, the Demiurge believes himself to be the one and only God, and he acts with arrogance and caprice that this mistaken belief engenders. He is the one who shapes the material world, and in some interpretations, is considered the God of the Old Testament. The interaction between Sophia and the Demiurge in a way serves to explain the Gnostic perspective on why the world is flawed and why human beings are trapped in a cycle of ignorance and suffering. But through self-knowledge and Gnosis, or spiritual insight, individuals can transcend the flawed physical realm created by the Demiurge and return to Pleroma, achieving reunification with the true God, the Oneness. Our world, our cosmos, was a horrifying prison created by a malevolent mistake. The crafter or demiurge of the universe was not God, not even a God, but a nightmarish demon, drunken with delusion, wrath, and jealousy. In Gnostic thought, human nature is a reflection of the dualistic universe it inhabits, composed of both flawed and divine elements. On one hand, humans have a physical and psychological aspect, created by the Demiurge, the lesser god who is responsible for the material world. On the other hand, they possess a spiritual essence, often described as a divine spark, which is a fragment of the true god's own transcendent light. But this inner divine spark is largely unrecognized by humans, a condition made worse by the Demiurge's influence, which serves to keep people in a state of ignorance. This lack of awareness about their own divine origin perpetuates suffering and entrapment in the material world. So, the ultimate goal then is to achieve Gnosis, or spiritual enlightenment, to become aware of this divine spark and thus return to unity with the true God. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the Living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. The Gospel of Thomas 32.19 Gnosis, translated as knowledge, signifies a direct experimental form of spiritual insight. It is more than mere intellectual understanding, it is a transformative realization of the divine essence within oneself. Through Gnosis, individuals can transcend the limitations of the material world and the deceptive influences of the Demiurge. The potential for achieving Gnosis and, consequently, salvation resides in every individual, man or woman. Unlike traditional religious doctrines that emphasize collective salvation, Gnosticism posits that salvation is a deeply personal endeavor. Then, you might wonder, what are some of the methods for achieving Gnosis? Various Gnostic sects offer different paths to achieve Gnosis, ranging from ascetic practices to elaborate rituals and initiations. 
Sacred texts, secret prayers, and mystical visions were often cited as means of acquiring this coveted spiritual knowledge. Let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished, and he will rule over all things. Gospel of Truth 32, 38-39 So, in Gnostic belief, the ultimate truth is not given but must be found, suggesting an individual's proactive role in their spiritual journey. Upon discovering this gnosis or secret knowledge, the individual must become confused because the newfound understanding often contradicts conventional religious and social norms. The trouble could point to the unsettling realization about the illusory nature of the material world and the deceptive role of the demiurge, the lesser god who created the physical realm. But after this realization, they will start to grasp the enormity and profoundity of the divine truth and gain mastery over one's own spiritual and material circumstances. The person has broken free from the limitations of the earthly realm and is now liberated and enlightened, achieving a state of being that transcends the physical world. In that way, we can clearly see where the perspectives of Orthodox Christians and Jews on divinity and humanity significantly differ from those of early Gnostic Christians. In Orthodox belief systems, a vast chasm exists between the Creator and humans. God is considered entirely distinct from His creation. In this worldview, Jesus comes as a Savior to rescue humanity from the burden of original sin. He holds a unique status as the Lord and Son of God, forever separate from the humanity he aims to save. His purpose is to guide humans back to God, yet he himself is not a mere human, but the Son of God, uniquely positioned to fulfill this salvific role. The Orthodox doctrine underscores that while humans can strive to emulate Jesus' virtues and follow his teachings, they can never achieve his unique divine status. Jesus then is not just another part of creation that needs saving, but is instead the means through which salvation is made possible for everyone else. Thus, this belief system supports a form of spiritual hierarchy, rooted in the idea that humanity is fundamentally flawed and requires an external savior. It creates a clear delineation between the divine and the human, emphasizing the need for divine intervention to achieve the ultimate spiritual goals of salvation and eternal life. In contrast, Gnostic teachings emphasize the oneness of the self and the divine. According to Gnostics, self-knowledge leads to knowledge of the real God, essentially making the individual the divine identical. In Gnostic thought, the divine is not just external, but also imminent within each individual. This intimate connection between the self and the divine paves the way for a spiritual transformation that is both profound and personal. Rather than being solely a savior who redeems humanity from sin, the living Jesus in Gnostic tradition serves as a spiritual guide. He leads individuals toward enlightenment by lifting the veil of illusion and ignorance that separates them from divine truth. The role of Jesus evolves as the disciple advances in spiritual understanding. Once a certain level of Gnosis or divine wisdom is achieved, the disciple's relationship with Jesus shifts. The spiritual hierarchy dissolves, giving way to a relationship of equality. Interestingly, Gnostic thought posits that once a disciple reaches a certain level of spiritual understanding, the role of Jesus as a spiritual master diminishes. The disciple and the master are seen as equals. This view of spiritual progress is exemplified in the Gospel of Philip, which states, Whoever achieves Gnosis becomes no longer a Christian, but a Christ. Gospel of Philip 67.26 Here, Gnosis is not merely an intellectual understanding, but a transformative experience that raises one's state of consciousness to a divine level. In this elevated state, the individual transcends the role of a follower and becomes, metaphorically speaking, a Christ, a being embodying divine wisdom and love. This idea pushes the boundaries of conventional Christian thought, challenging the uniqueness of Christ's divinity and opening the door to the divine potential within all of humanity. Gnosticism also promotes non-attachment and non-conformity to the material world. 
advocating for a mode of existence described as being in the world but not of the world. This Gnostic principle echoes a kind of spiritual dualism that separates the material from the spiritual realms. It emphasizes that while individuals may inhabit physical bodies and engage with the material world, their true essence is spiritual and divine. This view encourages a form of spiritual individualism that is not tied to material possessions, social statuses, or external validations. Instead, the focus is shifted to an inward journey toward enlightenment and Gnosis. This concept urges people to transcend the limitations imposed by the material world and societal norms. By not being of the world, Gnostics aim to live in a state that is somewhat detached from worldly desires and ambitions. This detachment is not an abandonment of the world, but rather a way to engage with it more authentically. By centering one's life on the pursuit of spiritual understanding, one can navigate the complexities of earthly existence without being ensnared by them. A relevant quote from the Gospel of Thomas, Logion 56, encapsulates this notion. Whoever has come to understand the world has found only a corpse, and whoever has found a corpse is superior to the world. This saying suggests that a deep understanding of the material world reveals its transient and illusory nature. Those who grasp this truth transcend worldly concerns and ascend to a higher level of spiritual understanding, becoming superior to the world. Jesus said, Recognize what is before you, and what is hidden from you will be revealed to you, for there is nothing hidden that will not be made manifest. The Gospel of Thomas in essence, Gnosticism emphasizes a kind of spiritual individualism, where the focus is on internal enlightenment rather than external validation. In this way, the Gnostic view advocates for a life that balances earthly existence with spiritual aspirations, teaching that true enlightenment comes from within and that the material world is not the ultimate reality. If you wonder whether the wisdom of the Gnostic Gospels is applicable today, well, Think of Gnosticism as a way to challenge ourselves, to delve deep within ourselves to uncover the divine spark that lies hidden, waiting to illuminate our path to spiritual liberation. So, far from being heretical or marginal as it has been labeled for millennia, the Gnostic Gospels serve as an essential reminder that the quest for spiritual enlightenment is inherently personal, urging us to look within. The answers are there. If you enjoyed this video, do us a favor, hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us out. And for more awesome content, check out our related videos on the screen right now. Keep your minds open, and until we meet again.